greatest life, uh, which was 15 years ago. I was an engineer for uh, uh, Boeing Space Systems. So I'm right there, a little red circle right there. This is Sea Launch. Unfortunately, Sea Launch exploded. Uh, it was a $200 million satellite there, and it went up in flames. Pretty spectacular. We had insurance though, so it wasn't too bad. Uh, but one of the things that I learned as an engineer is uh, it takes pieces to make something work very well. And so I took that idea when I became a teacher and what were the pieces that I needed to do? Where, there, there's the art of teaching and then there's the science of teaching. So I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about the science and then I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like in the classroom or the, the art of it. So this is one of my favorite movies. Um, I don't have a speaker, but you guys can imagine if you've seen it, and I'll play it. So it's a, a round hole in a square peg, and so they have to figure out for the, uh, the carbon uh, uh, to get the CO2 out of the uh, command module. Uh, they have to figure out a way how to make something round go and something square. And one of my favorite ideas is play is the beginning of knowledge. So we could have students playing with ideas and playing with equipment and, and whatever it is, then that opens the door to the knowledge that you want to give them uh, or the story that you want to tell uh, to them. So in my uh, department, I'm the department chair, and this is our goal, and this is something that I've shared with my department, and fortunately they're all on board with it. Uh, but these are the four components, and what we're looking at is what, what does that mean for the success of the student? So what is the student success criteria? So I'm gonna go through these very quickly, and then I'll show you what it looks like in the classroom. And then I'll be, I'll be throwing out some people that really changed my, my teaching and, and how I approach teaching. Uh, so student success criteria, these are the three most important things that you need to focus on if you want to provide students success or you want to push your students forward. Uh, the book is by Dylan William uh, Outstanding. I don't know the guy, but it's an amazing book. And he talks about one of the things that really stood out uh, in his book is the moment you give a student a grade, they stop learning. And I feel that that is very true. So all these activities that you see that I'm going to show you or at least one of the lessons, they're not graded. The students are exploring, they're playing, they're trying to figure things out. There is no grade associated with any of this. I just want them to play, explore, and integrate these ideas, their, their lives, into what the physics is and what's happening. Uh, so he talks a lot about self-regulation. What are the components of self-regulation? Uh, what does this look like in terms of problem solving? And how do you embed, and that's the title, how do you embed formative assessments so you can constantly, constantly see what the student is learning so the student can also see what they're learning and so the students can grow themselves without the teacher actually telling them. They're taking an intrinsic motivation to their learning uh, versus uh, uh, compliance, which is what you don't want. You want them to learn because they're excited to learn. The other component, and I've been using this for, for many years now, is Universal Design for Learning. So this was originally developed for uh, special education students, but it's across the board. You can use it for any type of student or adult. I've used these in presentations with adults. And there's three components, uh, and they allow the student or the adult to self-regulate. And so you have different stages from top to bottom. All these resources are on the, uh, the link to this presentation, so you can download this. You can go to Universal Design for Learning uh, to CAST, and you can see what this research is about. Uh, but this is important because I want my students to self-regulate. I want them to be interested. So, but how do I create that in a lesson? This gives you ideas of how you can integrate this into a lesson. And also for, for the teachers in my department, when I observe them, are they meeting those needs within the strategies that they're implementing uh, in their classroom? And if they're not, then it's a good point of discussion to have with them. How can we increase or how can we change their strategies to better implement, uh, to uh, push students in, in, in their success? We have the next generation science standards. Uh, one of the core elements of all the lessons that I create are the three, uh, three elements of NGSS, the, the 3D learning. Uh, and one of the things that I tell a lot of teachers, because 
know, and it, it, it changes from district to district and how this looks. But the NGSS is a toolkit. What is the story you want to tell? What is the phenomenon you want to share with your students? And then you connect it to these three elements. Do you want them to look at patterns? Do you want them to question, uh, you know, what are the performance expectations? That comes way later, after you've developed your phenomenon, after you've developed your storyline, then you can link it back to these components and see, okay, does these descriptions or these requirements for those specific elements, do they meet the needs that I have for my particular lesson or unit? So it's, it's, it's backward planning versus a lot of uh, teachers that I've talked to, they, they look at the three colors and they want to implement the three colors. It's, it's just a toolkit to help you uh, develop your lesson and develop your ideas and make sure that students are learning what they need to learn from, from the lesson you're giving from the unit. And then finally, the last part is the assessment for learning. Uh, this is actually uh, from an NSTA article. Uh, it's a pretty good article. Uh, it's also on the link you can download it. Uh, but this talks about uh, developing learning targets so that students can uh, uh, you know, understand what they're learning. Uh, descriptive feedback. Uh, setting up rubrics so that students understand, you know, what they've learned. And simple rubrics, holistic rubrics, like uh, one through five scale, or even simpler, you could do uh, uh, in progress, proficient, and mastery. Uh, so you're trying to move them along. You want them to see where they're growing, and as a teacher, you're also trying to see where you need to push them. If they need intervention or support, uh, you can use this type of assessment system to help you see, and the students help them see where they need to. And then finally, this is, this is uh, one of the groups I've worked with at Loyola Marymount University is Math Leadership by Design. And I've been with them since 2007. And so a lot of times, what does this look like in the classroom? All these other elements, well, we've developed, or they developed, uh, these four instructional moves. Uh, and it works really awesome. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to show you two of these instructional moves. We're not going to get to the mini lesson, but I'll explain what we did uh, with the mini lesson for the unit I'm show, or the lesson I'm going to show you. And then the application uh, comes later, so I won't be able to show you that. Oh, one, one small plug, because I, I forgot about this. Uh, Paige Keeley. So I went to one of her presentations several years ago, and she focused on misconceptions. And she has some really outstanding books out. Uh, but I use the ideas that she came up with in, her, in many books on misconceptions, science probes, and have actually developed my own. Uh, and that's one of the key things. How do you get the students, uh, how do you get to the students' misconceptions? And then how can you uh, remove those misconceptions by them exploring and playing? So uh, this is my learning target for the, for the Lesson that I'm going to show you. Uh, notice that everything is color code. This is for AP Physics, uh, but I treat it just like learning any new language. Physics is a new language, so I have to treat it the same way. So uh, the same as you would have like English learners. Uh, these are all new words to them. Uh, everything is color coded, and they have an idea of where I'm going to take them within the lesson. Then comes a, a, a low floor, high ceiling question. Uh, multiple answers to this. They don't know what the answer is. They could they could come up with anything. What causes an object to rotate? They'll start <coughs> with whiteboards and they'll start showing me. Oh, I think this does this, or this is a force, or you know whatever it is. They'll start coming up with different ideas. There is no correct answer. Uh, but to make it culturally relevant and uh, emotionally relevant to them, then I present and I'll show you this quick video. This is how I get them hooked. So uh, I'm asking for a volunteer from the audience. Obviously, I'm not going to do the kid. That's one of the teachers. She comes in, and then we do a... Uh... So she, she's a fourth degree black belt. She's OK. It's all a demo. This has been practiced many times before. Uh, so now they have the focus question. They're like, okay, so what caused uh, uh, Ms. Delgado to, to rotate? So now they start brainstorming and start trying to figure out what does this mean? What does rotation mean? What are things that are causing rotation? So they'll come up with torque and forces and different ideas. 
So then I'll come back to it, to this question. I say, okay, so uh, Mr. Delgado had a certain mass. What happens if I change the mass of the person? What would happen to my force? So I bring in one of the security guards for our school. <laughs> and then I ask him, okay, so if I change the mask, what's gonna happen to the force that you guys are saying that I apply or the torque? So I wasn't gonna flip them. <laughs> disappointed uh, but I was gonna flip them but you know they start thinking okay so what happens if my mass increases what happens to the force so now comes the play part and they're just been uh, well not the play part yet so now they have to make a claim they have to decide on a claim uh, and this is a this is a science probe inspired by Paige Keeley's books uh, and they have to pick one of these and they have to commit to one of these answers and they have to put a sticky note and they have to put it right next to it and then Whatever it is, there's no right or wrong answer yet, they're gonna figure out the right answer. I'm never gonna tell them the answer. And that's one of the key things of story-driven uh, uh, lessons. You never give them the answer. They will all ask, they will always ask, well, what is the answer? I don't know, your guys are gonna figure it out on your own. I'm just gonna lead you to it, and eventually they'll come up with the answer. Uh, so majority always pick, I'll show you what they pick. I think I had that on the, uh, yeah. So usually they'll pick two and three. Uh, so now the next step is they made a they they picked the claim. So now they're going to start figuring out if this is actually true. Uh, so this is an investigation model uh, a graphic organizer that I came up with uh, to help them organize. And what they'll do is they'll look at the first two parts: the claim and the blue sky. Blue sky is uh, uh, brainstorming. I just call it blue sky because it sounds cool. Uh, so they'll start coming up. They'll write their claim. They'll start coming up with models, and they'll get these. Uh, You'll get these kits, very simple kits, CDs with marbles and clay and a dowel. And they have to come up with a model. And the, and the, the design problem is uh, design a vehicle that can roll down a ramp the quickest. And so they have to figure out, okay, how does mass affect how quickly a vehicle can roll down? Where does the placement of the mass affect how quickly the vehicle can, can roll down? So if you notice, some students put them all the way on the outside, some students put it all the way on the inside and I don't tell them this and, and they're really into it but you can imagine like figure skaters right so when they're spinning their arms are out really slow and then when they put their arms in they go really fast so it's a conservation of angular momentum but it works the same thing uh, with these models so that same principle affects how the vehicles move down and then this is the race and I make a big old event, the Grand Prix in Lennox Academy. Uh, the, the winning team gets a, a, a stack of stickers. They love stickers. And they're always your, your rulers and straight. I'm always giving advantage to them, they're always complaining. So they notice that the vehicle with the mass that's closer to <coughs> axis of rotation goes quicker because it has less inertia. And they're like, whoa, what's happening? What's going on? Uh, so they see this, what's happening, what's going on? And then now the next part is that they're gonna break down those properties. What were the properties that caused that? And they're gonna collect data. Uh, they're gonna use the second part of, uh, and we use giant whiteboards and, uh, or poster boards. And the next part is actually collecting data and then trying to figure out the reason why and they're very creative. I actually don't tell them what type of data to collect. They collect data and then they see what the results are. But what they notice is, as the mass gets closer to the center of rotation, uh, the velocity, the linear velocity of the vehicle increases. Some of them will start getting an exponential curve and they start coming up with equations that I'm not gonna share with them, but I want them to figure them out. So they start developing these equations that, that describe uh, or predict what the model is gonna do. So then we come back to this and I say, okay, well, let's go back to your sticky matrix. Do you want to change your answer? And they start changing their answers. So now they say, okay, we think it's two, but now we also think it's three. 
And in fact, that is correct. Two and three are correct because you do need friction to make an object rotate. If there is no friction, you can imagine a car in a very icy road, it'll just start spinning. It's not gonna go anywhere. So in fact, they get both of those correct. I don't tell them that though, because there's still more experimenting that they have to do. Um, and that's the last part for the showcase that I have for you. Now, uh, I'm also a Science Friday collaborator. So this resource is actually on the Science Friday website. They're a national radio program. Uh, you can get this resource. They got a bunch of other resources there. Uh, but mine is called also how to look at properties of, of rotation. And it'll actually go through all the steps.